I have made quite a few videos featuring Intel's Pentium 2 and Pentium 3 CPUs. Compared to earlier Pentium versions, those CPUs were packaged in a cartridge-like housing. The reason for shifting to the so-called single-edge contact cartridge was to reduce the distance between the CPU core and the level 2 cache, which now moved from the motherboard to the CPU. Intel released the Pentium 2 233 in mid-1997, while AMD was just releasing the K6 having a similar frequency. It took AMD another two years to release the Athlon CPUs for the Slot A platform, the counterpart to Intel's Slot 1. And on March 6, 2000, AMD released the first CPU clocked at 1000 MHz, two days before Intel was able to release the Pentium 3 1000. The classic Athlon was an enormous success for AMD. At launch, it was on average 10% faster than the Pentium 3 at the same clock frequency for business applications, and 20% faster for gaming workloads. The Athlon no longer suffers from a weak floating point unit and also supports, next to AMD's enhanced 3D Now, Intel's extended MMX instruction set. Before the release of the Athlon CPUs, AMD developed drop-in replacements for Intel platforms, offering an alternative that was usually more affordable. The Athlon was AMD's first product that deviated from previous practices and made it necessary to develop their own platform called Slot A. Visually similar to Intel's Slot 1, AMD used the same connector for the CPUs, just rotated by 180 degrees. The board and the CPU you can see in today's video were recovered from a scrapyard. So that the board is in this poor condition says nothing about my retro hardware storing skills. Hopefully, we will be able to restore this motherboard to a looking like new condition. Before soaking the board in water, I remove the battery as well as any plastic parts that can be easily removed. I want to test the condition of the battery later. Any remaining charge may suggest a recent usage of the board. And the plastic parts are just in the way during the cleaning process. A water bath is the easiest way to get rid of unwanted dirt and dust. Once the board is thoroughly rinsed, I can use soap to get stubborn residue off the surface. I use dish soap to get any greasy dirt, oil or liquid off the board. A small brush helps me to get into hard to reach corners and edges. And then we just need to rinse the board one more time to get rid of any soap water. Now the board needs to dry properly before we can check those bulgy capacitors around the power delivery area next to the CPU slot. While the board is drying we can focus on the CPU itself. But this aluminum brick could have been mounted to the CPU over 20 years ago. So it is certainly better to replace the thermal compound between the CPU and the cooler. But before we continue with this restoration, a quick shout out to PCBWay, your go-to destination for top tier printed circuit boards. PCBWay's state of the art manufacturing facility ensures the highest quality for your electronic projects. With a seamless online ordering process, you can easily customize and order PCBs tailored for your specification. PCBWay also offers other services like 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and CNC machining. Enjoy rapid turnaround times, competitive pricing and a dedicated support team ready to assist you at every step. Elevate your designs with PCBWay, where innovation meets reliability. Links to PCBWay.com are in the video description. This cooling solution comes with a powerful fan. A fan with a power rating of almost 3 watts is not going to be a pleasant experience. For now I will keep the fan, but it feels like it has reached the end of its life. So, we just have a thermal pad that is used to exchange the heat between the CPU and the cooler. This solution has served its purpose. It is time to replace it with fresh thermal paste. The aluminum cooler looks a little bit weird after I cleaned its surface, as if something has damaged the top layer. But it is completely smooth. At least I cannot feel any roughness when running my fingers over the surface. I applied thermal paste, reattached the cleaned fan and fitted the aluminum cooler back to the AMD CPU, which is now ready for testing. Let's turn our attention to the motherboard. It was drying for at least 24 hours and should be free from any water residue. 
This is a motherboard from Jetway. I admit, I have never heard of this brand before, but it is listed on the retro web. There are manual, BIOS versions and drivers available. But unfortunately, before we can power on this board, we need to take care of those bulged capacitors. Let's first check the resistance on the power rails. This is a good place to verify that there is no short on the board. The 5 volt line seems to charge capacitors, which seem to hold the charge quite well before we fall back to zero. I assume this power rail to be fine. But the 3.3V line seems to be draining power quickly. This could be normal behavior if we consider that the chipset, audio controller or any other chips could be connected to this power rail. But it could also be aging capacitors. Let's recheck this power rail once we're done with the repair. I already recapped an ASUS P4B motherboard which had capacitors a lot worse. While working on that board, I created a small circuit to visually show the differences between good and bad capacitors. With a multimeter, an ESR meter or a component tester, we would just get a few numbers. But with a light bulb, we can see how a capacitor behaves in a circuit. I have replaced all 11 bulged capacitors around the CPU slot, as well as a few extra ones in the same area. Let's quickly retest the resistance at the power connector, this time with the new capacitors in place. For both, the 3.3 and the 5 volt rail, I get the exact same reading as I did with the old capacitors. The 3.3V rail still drops the charge a lot quicker compared to the 5V rail. As said before, I expect this to be normal behavior, but let me know in the comments if you think otherwise. Now we can go ahead and test the capacitors I took off the board. The capacitors which do not show any sign of bulging seem to still be in working condition. When I use them in my test circuit, they let the light bulb fade in and fade out. Depending on the capacitance, this fade effect can be longer for larger capacitors and shorter for smaller capacitors. I think those capacitors would be okay to be left on the board. That is also why I did not go ahead and replace any of the other capacitors on the board, which I initially planned to do. If you are regularly recapping boards, I would like to know your opinion. Should I go ahead and replace the remaining capacitors? What about those smaller ones? Would you replace those too? Please let me know in the comments. Let's move on to the capacitors with a bulge on the top. The swelling of capacitors is an indicator that a significant portion of the electrolyte has decomposed and in the process released gas which leads to increased internal pressure. And the result is bulging capacitors, which are supposed to be replaced since their proper operation is no longer guaranteed. Well, to keep the suspense short, any of the bulging caps prevents the LED from turning on. When the capacitor is in the circuit before I press the button, no light appears. If I connect the capacitor while the LED is already on, the light turns off the moment the capacitor becomes part of the circuit. At no point the LED is fading in, which would indicate a charging and saturating capacitor. Those capacitors seem to leak the entire current that is going through the circuit. Imagine what stress this could cause to the MOSFETs responsible for power delivery. Most of the current that is meant for the CPU is going through those caps to ground and the power delivery circuit could face intense power draw while the board is on. At best, the system may not power on, or the CPU may appear to be non-working because it doesn't receive enough power to function. Another possibility could be that the extensive power draw triggers the overcurrent protection of the power supply. And in the worst case scenario, we would end up with a damaged motherboard. In such a case, the power delivery circuit is overwhelmed, destroying MOSFETs and other components due to excessive heat or power draw. But all those scenarios are just what I could imagine. If you disagree, you know where to correct me. Now let me have a look at the battery that was in the board when I found it. And it still has a voltage of 2.87 volts. That is by far more than I expected. Either this battery held its charge really well or someone replaced it just a few years ago. But it looks like that this board was used for a lot longer than many other boards from that era. Let's assemble the board and see if it still works. By the way, I think this board has one of the worst locations for the IDE and floppy drive connectors. Both are right next to the HEP port, the perfect location for cables to block the airflow around the graphics card. Never mind, now we are ready to power on the board for the very first time. Hey, and it looks like the board is working. 
This is great news, I finally have a K7 system with an Athlon 700 on a slot A platform. Before we update the BIOS, let's visit the homepage of the manufacturer Jetway, in the year 2000. How is that possible? With the Wayback Machine. Early websites were just a bit simpler. And our slot A motherboard is featured right on the start page. We can navigate to the product details page and get more details about the features of this board. There is also a download area where drivers and tools are listed. Unfortunately, most of the files are missing and cannot be downloaded. Oh, and initially, this board was listed under slot 1 motherboards. Chatway corrected this error only way later and introduced a slot A category. Here is an overview of the BIOS releases and the changes in each version. We are currently running on version A03 and we will update the board to the latest, A06. I'm using Uniflash to update the BIOS of this board. This little tool is easy to use and works with most of the boards I have tested so far. It is my go-to application to flash BIOS chips of working motherboards. And we are done. Let's power cycle and see if the board is booting with a new firmware. And version A06 is showing up on the boot screen. After resetting the BIOS settings, installing Windows 98 and the GeForce 2MX graphics card drivers, we can install the VIA 4-in-1 driver package. Somehow I have bad memories about this software. I can't pinpoint it, but I think I do remember having a lot of trouble with VIA back then. For my short tests however, everything worked well. I could even install the audio drivers, and we are greeted with a Windows startup sound. The only application I could download from the Wayback Machine was the VIA hardware monitor. This is just a one-page information tool that shows the current CPU temperature, fan speed and voltages. Additionally, you can set alarms in case the temperature gets too high or the fan speed drops below a certain value. I want to end this video with a thermal image of the board. None of the components seem to overheat. Some reviews about this board mention the oddly located drive connectors, but also the poorly designed power delivery system. The reviewers complain about high temperatures and that it would have been better for Chetway to add heatsinks to the MOSFETs. But so far I don't see any reason for concern. I could play a few rounds of Need for Speed without noticing any worrying temperature increases. And with this we have reached the end of this video. Let me know in the comments regarding the remaining capacitors on this board. Should I replace them all? And please like the video if you enjoyed today's content. Also subscribe to the channel if you want to get notified whenever I upload something new. Thanks for watching and I will see you in one of my other videos.